Great to have you again on Side by Side and following yesterday's conclusion of the Beatitudes, I want for a little while to take you on a journey, a very different journey, through Tales of the Covenanters. This was a book written by Robert Pollock. He himself was born in Renfrewshire. He was born in 1789 and he died just 28 years later in 18 and 27 uh, with consumption, as they called it, with tuberculosis. But he had already written a number of books and a, a great long prose of which 78,000 copies had been sold. And they then, many people who respected his poetry and his writing, put up a wonderful memorial to him. And you can still see that as the one that I'm using as the sort of picture for this little series, at least for the beginning. What I'm going to read you is maybe going to seem a little bit outdated for the copy of the book that I have was given as a prize for Harival Sunday School, afternoon Sunday School in Ballymena in 1891. The connection that I have to that is that I attended Harival afternoon Sunday School in the 1960s when my mother lived in that area of Ballymena. And so I have memories. I'm not sure what sort of memories because I might not have been a great student, but I have some good memories and some uh, not so good when I experienced the odd assault by other boys when I was crossing one part of the town to the other and they identified me as not from their particular part of the town in order to go to afternoon Sunday school. So maybe I could say, if I was pushing it a little bit, that I experienced a, a minor degree of persecution in going to afternoon Sunday school. Well, I think that's maybe stretching things, but we'll go with it. I'm not sure if it will last a little longer than 10 minutes for the day, but I hope you'll enjoy listening to this story. It's this story called Helen of the Glen, and it's the story that begins with her father and her mother. And it's taking place in the time when Christians, especially the Covenanters, who believed that there was only one king, and that was Christ and the, the king of the land could not, could not call them to worship or to submit to his rule against Christ's rule. And the days we're living in may not be so far removed at times from this. But who knows where we will all be in times to come. Anyway, such were the perilous times in which Helen and William, the subjects of this story, uh, grew up in. Their father was James Thompson. And although he was born in the district of Ayrshire, he moved to Glasgow with Agnes Craig, his beloved wife. But because of his generosity, his unsuspicious sincerity, as it's described of his character, his business just seemed to go down and down. And he was compelled to leave Scotland. So to support himself and send something if possible for his family, he entered the service of King Charles II. He followed the army to the continent and in a short time, he died in Holland fighting bravely. Immediately after the painful parting that Mrs. Thompson had, she returned to the place of her birth in the neighbourhood of Loudon Hill. And you can understand the feelings that she had going back to her homeland. And the name of the little habitation is called Clough Head. It was situated at the head of one of those solitary glens so common in the wilder districts of Scotland. I kind of feel as though I, I, I should encourage you to light the fire and throw another peat on just now, because the interior where the peat burned on the hearth and the smoke rose up unconfined by the chimney till it escaped by a little hole in the roof. Although very unlike the abode Mrs. Thompson had left in Glasgow, she soon rendered it by her own industry and cleanliness, the ready assistance of the farmer, a place as neat and comfortable as any dwelling, humble though it was. In this lovely area, spread out to the west, were the fertile but monotonous districts of Ayrshire, watered by those streams delightfully romantic when you approach them, Ayr, Irving and Dun, which carried the eye down their course till it reposed in the glassy bosom of the Atlantic, oftener in those days visited by the dreadful warship than enlivened by the cheerful sail of the merchantman. In this humble dwelling, surrounded by the chaste and solemn countenance of nature, did Mrs. Thompson set herself diligently to educate her children. 
to imbue their minds early with habits of industry, and above all, to bring them up in the fear of the Lord, to teach them to know and remember their Creator in the days of their youth. Every morning and evening she went, leading Helen in one hand and William in the other, to the farmhouse, and joined with the old shepherd in worshipping the God of salvation. Early on the dawn of every Sabbath, she was up, prepared and ready, communing with God in private, for setting out often five, sometimes six, or seven miles to the place where the preaching of God's word was. And in those days, surely you know, it was no smooth road, no pleasure walk to the house of God. It was in a solitary myrrh hut, maybe, the glen of the mountain, or the cave of the rock, where often these were the only places in which the voice of the true servants of God, the, ser the shepherds that shall never need to be ashamed, could be heard. Even here the bloody fiend of persecution pursued them with fire and sword. The meetings were, or conventicles as they were called, of these poor artless Christians were often dispersed by the insolent and merciless soldiers. Many were taken and sent, some to the gibbet, some to the dungeons, and many to the British plantations abroad. And all this because they assembled themselves to seek the Lord, the God of their fathers, in a way that their conscience approved. Often she would kneel down with her son and daughter at her side, by the stream that purled down the secluded glen, and seek with fervency of a mother's heart, which trusts in God, that her Father in heaven would shed down upon them the blessing that makes rich and brings no sorrow. Every day she would read a portion of the Bible and taught her children to read it, taught them to understand much of it, and above all, taught them, and chiefly by her own example, to reverence and do what it said. Thus would she converse with Helen, for William was yet too young to profit by her instructions, and she would say, How great, my dear, is the love of God in Christ Jesus. You read in the Bible that we are all sinners. That is, we all naturally hate God, and God hates us because we are not holy, nor willing to be made holy. You read in the Bible that Adam and Adam all died and became liable to the wrath and curse of God. And you know that we sin every day against God ourselves. The thoughts of our hearts are evil continually. This is our condition, my dear Helen, and this is our sad condition by nature. Do you feel it to be sad? Would you like to be out of it? I love you, my dear, and I can do much for you, but I cannot take away your sins. I cannot make your peace with God. None of your friends, no man in the world, no angel in heaven can pardon your sins. What then are you to do? How great, as I said, is the mercy of God in Christ. In your low and lost estate, he remembers you with love. And when there was no other eye to pity, no other hand to help, God said, Deliver from going down to the pit, from going down to hell. For I have found a ransom. This ransom is Jesus Christ who came into the world and suffered and died that we might live. You remember that he says, Suffer the little children to come to me and do not forbid them. If you come to him, he will. if you believe that he died for your sin, God will pardon you and forever you will be at peace. But you ask me, my dear, how can you believe in Christ? You must pray to God that you may have this belief. You remember what our Saviour himself said, Ask and it shall be given you. Seek and you shall find. Knock and it shall be opened to you. The Holy Spirit will help you to pray. And Paul tells us that. The Holy, the Holy Spirit intercedes for us with groans that cannot be uttered. Whatever you ask in my name, says the kind Redeemer, it shall be given to you. So, so great is my Father's, our Father's loving kindness. Remember these things, my dear Helen. Remember these things. You don't know how soon you may die or how soon may you lose your mother. If I should be removed from you, your best instructor will be the Bible. Read it, Helen. Read it often. It is surprising to notice how this sacred book is neglected by sinful men. Their desires of taste and fashion, they spend their days in, nights in, pouring over morbid pages of sensual and fictitious narrative. And yet if God was to ask them if they read the book which he sent from heaven, where would they look? How could they say that they'd never read the precious gift throughout? Take your Bible in your hand. Make it the companion of your way. 
In the thirsty desert of this world it will supply the water of life. In the darkness of doubt it will cast a gleam of heaven over your path. In the struggle of temptation and in the hour of affliction it will lift up the voice of warning and encouragement and comfort. And tomorrow we're going to continue our story and I look forward to joining with you then.